Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today we're celebrating one of the greatest television sitcoms of all time, The Dick Van Dyke Show. The show ran for five seasons from 1961 to 1966 with 158 episodes, and it won 15 Emmy Awards. In 2002, the series was ranked at number 13 on TV Guide's 50 Greatest TV Shows of All Time. Last year, 2021, marked the 60th anniversary of this legendary show, as well as Dick Van Dyke's 96th birthday. Our guest can easily be considered the show's number one fan. He's the editor and publisher of the Walnut Times, the Dick Van Dyke Show newsletter, which he published for 20 years. He recently completed a fully authorized feature-length documentary entitled The Dick Van Dyke Show, celebrating the 60th anniversary. This beautifully produced and comprehensive documentary includes archival and new interview footage with people that were there at the time. And we also hear the insights and perspectives of the second generation Dick Van Dyke Show family. Our guests developed friendships with Dick Van Dyke, Carl Reiner, Rosemarie, and many other cast and crew members. I'm delighted to welcome David Van Dusen to our show. David, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Harvey. It's a pleasure to be here and, and share my passion for what I do think is the, the greatest sitcom in television history. So thanks for having me. David, although you made your living as a New York State civil servant, your real passion was as a fan of the Dick Van Dyke show. What was it about the show that captivated you so much? You know, Carl Reiner's genius in, in writing to situations that we can all relate to, right? So the, the, the premise of the show always started with Carl saying to, to writers and others, what happened to you over the weekend, right? And it was those, those events and those moments that he capitalized on, right? And what was the best part of that was he, could, he had a stellar cast with which to, to deal. Dick, Dick Van Dyke was somewhat unknown at the time, but what a jewel she, he and Sheldon Leonard found in, in Dick Van Dyke in terms of Dick's comic delivery and his physical acuity and all the, all the things that he could do to have showbiz veterans, Maury Amsterdam and Rose Marie join the cast, and then to, to find a newcomer of Mary Tyler Moore who just picked up on things so quickly from, from the longevity of those show business veterans, right? And I, and I think all of those together were what intrigued me. And also I, I enjoy music and, and productions. So I always enjoyed the musical numbers that they did, right? And, and certainly appreciated Earl Hagen's fabulous arrangements that he did on the show. Many of the characters were based on real people, correct? They were, they were. Many of Carl's neighbors, the names even, you know, make it into, into, the, uh, into the show. And as I said, particularly situations uh, that were true to life, many of Carl's own things, many of the writers own, own scenarios and situations that they personally experienced. Dick Van Dyke's character was based on Carl Reiner when he was a writer for Sid Caesar's Your Show of Shows. The character Alan Brady played by Carl Reiner was based on a mix of Jackie Gleason and Milton Berle, correct? He, he, yes. So Reiner said, not any one particular person, but certain characteristics of many, right? He certainly wanted to make sure that people didn't think Alan Brady was Sid Caesar because he was not that, right? But, but I think, yes, some of those traits, the egomaniacal nature of some of his comments, the self-centeredness were all brilliantly portrayed by Reiner. And, and for the early part of the show, we didn't even see see Alan Brady. All we heard was his voice or the back, saw the back of his head, right? And that was intentional on Carl's part to, because he didn't think people would believe he, having been the second banana on Sid Caesar, that he could be the head of a, of a celebrity television show. But what brilliance in, in Carl Reiner's thinking to, to mastermind such a scenario for us all. Carl Reiner initially conceived of the show being called Head of the Family with a completely different cast. Is that right? That's true. Carl played the role of the name, the actor Rob, or the character Rob Petrie, as opposed to, to Petrie back then, right? And it didn't really work. It, di it didn't come off well. And 
and the show sat for quite some time. It was only when Sheldon Leonard read some of Carl's scripts and they got hooked together for a meeting that uh, Sheldon could see the potential in, in Carl's writing and Carl's production and said, we've got we to try it again with a better actor to play you, in the words of Sheldon Leonard, right? So. You published a newsletter about the show for 20 years called The Walnut Times. What kinds of things did you write about in the newsletter? Well, it, it was uh, many, many different s- sections, Harvey. I always had or tried to do a feature story on one of the main cast members. So for those folks who were living at the time, I conducted interviews and that would be the, the feature story. But I also highlighted many of the guest stars who were relative, some of them unknowns at the time. And this is just one credit that they got to add to the resume, which many of them now looking back 60 years would say, that's my most, I take the most pride in that credit that I was on the the Dick Van Dyke show, right? So uh, it would be a feature story about a main cast member. We talk about a, a, a guest star who was on the show. I would share what current day events perhaps the cast were involved with, a new show that they were on, a public appearance they were making, focused on merchandise that were, was available for fans to purchase if, if there were things that were about. And then I always had what I called a from the editor column. So I would make, often make trips to, to LA and visit with the cast and I would share some of the stories of, of those interactions that I had. Now, for people who are real aficionados of the Dick Van Dyke show, they will have noticed by now, David, that you are sitting in a very familiar space. How did you produce that space? So, yes, I'm sitting in the Alan Brady Show writer's room, if you will, where Rob and Buddy and Sally did all of their creative things. The, the, the set that you see be, behind me was actually created with some 3D software that I uh, learned as uh, COVID came upon us. It sort of helped me survive, I think, the the early parts of the COVID pandemic. And literally, Harvey, I started with a blank blank page and built the back wall and then began to add the curtains and the other objects in in the room, many of which I built from scratch so that they were as authentic that they could be. So the little coat rack that you see standing uh, in the rear of the room there behind me, I I built from scratch, right? And the the lamp that's on the wall, that that famous uh, lamp that everybody recognizes, I built from scratch. I I can lean here over to one side. I don't know if you could see, but on the little board in the hallway there, that was always an inside joke on the show where the prop person would put his name or others from the show or little inside jokes. The name Van Dusen actually lives on that board back there today. Since I redesigned the office, I felt I could use a little of my own privilege and, and put my name up there. The, the set actual actually played a, a nice role uh, at the start of my documentary. Tell us about your friendship with Dick Van Dyke. How did you meet him? I first met Dick on the set of Diagnosis Murder in January of 1997. I'd been publishing the Walnut Times for a couple of years at that point. And I had already interviewed Dick and I was planning a trip to LA and got in touch with Dick's publicist and said, I'm going to be out in LA. Could I possibly, you know, stop by and meet Dick? And the answer was a resounding yes. So on, on, we went to the set of diagnosis murder and sort of stood in the shadows as they shot a few scenes. And there was a break and, overcame this gentleman and stuck out his hand and he said, you know, hi, I'm Dick Van Dyke. And I wanted to say, yeah, no kidding. (laughs) But Dick was exactly as you would expect him to be. And what I mean by that is very down to earth. You know, when you think of Hollywood legends, right, to me, the names like Carl Reiner and Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore and, and like that come to mind, right? But, but I would have to tell you that my experience, particularly with Dick and with Carl, were always the most friendly, down-to-earth conversations. You know, we, I, we would go to lunch in Malibu, Dick and I, uh, with his publicist, and just have, have normal conversations uh, about things. And I'd stop by and visit Carl at his house, and, and we'd sit in the same 
living room where he and Mel Brooks sat, you know, watching TV at night and chat about things and catch up. And, and there was certainly an interest on my part in, in being with them and learning from them. But I would say at the same time, they would have a genuine interest in what I was doing or what was going on in, in my life as well. Very, very rewarding to find out these two entertainment icons were just very nice, down to earth folks. It really is very heartwarming to know that he was so welcoming to you and so appreciative of your devotion to the show. And it really says a lot that of all the shows and movies Dick Van Dyke did, he has always said that his all time favorite was the Dick Van Dyke show. That's really something, isn't it? Yeah. Dick, Dick calls it the best five years of his life. Right. And, and, and he would say it and others would say, too, is he was really playing himself. Carl had the knack and the ability to really write to the actors, observe their nuance, get to know how they would react. Right. And really wrote to those roles for all of the cast, you know, Mary and Dick and Rosie and Maury and Richard Deacon. Right. And, and the, the banter that Maury and Deke had uh, on the set when in real life they were such great friends, right? But they could leverage the, the nature of that relationship to produce the things that we all remember about, about Buddy's ball jokes about Mel, right? We, we still remember them today, so. What about Carl Reiner? How did you meet him? My first in-person meeting was, Carl invited me to his favorite Japanese restaurant uh, near Beverly Hills. And we, we met there and I had never been to a Japanese restaurant until that day. So Carl took great pleasure in introducing me to various Japanese delicacies and tempura and all those sorts of things. And we just had a very, very nice visit. Again, Carl, very appreciative of my endeavor, trying to, and keeping the the memory of the show alive and in the hearts and minds of folks. And it was just a, a, a wonderful privilege for me as a fan to meet him for the first time and, and have such a nice engagement, you know, such a nice lunch. Did you ever get to meet Mary Tyler Moore? I did meet Mary. Mary actually had a home. I'm out, I'm in upstate New York outside of Albany. Mary owned a home down in Millbrook, New York, not too far from here. My first meeting with Mary was uh, she had written her biography after all. And I took a drive down to the book signing that she had. And I stood in line with others. But when I got there, introduced myself and she said, oh, uh, I, I know you and I know the Walnut Times because it, it was in publication at the time. And we had a, a nice short chat amidst the chaos of, of the very heavily attended book signing. But she, she was always very nice to me. Mary seemed, was a bit more private than many of the others from the show. So while we had a good rapport, we, we didn't have contact often, but uh, we had a very, a very positive rapport and she was also very supportive of the newsletter. What about Rosemarie? Tell us about your friendship with her. Well, Rosemarie was a dear friend, and I got to know her quite well through the years. And we often would get, you know, we would always, always get together when I, when I got to L.A. Uh, we would go to dinner. We would go to lunch. We would sit and, and have conversations in her little bar room, if you will, at, at, at her home. And... We, you know, I think of, of all the cast, probably she was the one that I became the closest with in that we shared birthday cards and Christmas gifts and, and all that, that sort of thing. And, you know, it's, I, I'm in a u unique scenario, Harvey, here, because I'm the age of the second generation of the Dick Van Dyke Show family, if you will, right? So I'm close in age to the children's ages of, Dick and Carl and Rosemary and Jerry Paris and Ann Gilbert. So I, I've also through the years been fortunate to become friends and forge friendships with so many of the kids of the cast, right? And it, it's 
the, the, the timing was is just sort of impeccable in that I'm the age of, of those kids and could fit into that, fit into that scenario, if you will. Rosemary actually gave an interview for the documentary, didn't she? The footage I used of Rosemary was from a number of years ago, but the sentiments that she offered really, as I reviewed the footage, rang true with exactly the sentiment of, of where I was going, which was that 60 years later, right? The, still, the show still holds up. It is still funny. And again, it's funny because of the fact that Reiner's situations are those that each of us can relate to, whether it's your kid at school or opening your spouse's mail or a situation at work. Uh, I, my, my daily routine is, you know, I'm up early and I hop on the treadmill and I pop in the next episode of the Van Dyke show and I listen on headphones while I'm, while I'm on the treadmill, but I'll often go down for breakfast and my wife will say, what, what were you laughing at up there? Right. And I'm like, well, I was, I was watching the Dick Van Dyke show and it's still funny, even though I know what's coming. It's, it's that look that Dick gives Mary or Maury gives to Rosemary or Deacon's huffing and puffing as he leaves the office. Right. It's, it's true comedy, and it, I think it affords us the ability to laugh at ourselves and, and know that we're just like others. Did you get to meet Maury Amsterdam? Unfortunately, only by telephone. I was scheduled to meet Maury on my first trip to Los Angeles in January of 97 when I met Dick. And unfortunately, Maury passed in the October just preceding that. But Maury would often call the house to tell a joke. He would call, call and say, David, Maury Amsterdam, I got a new joke to tell you. And he, he would tell you the joke. Maury was just a very fun guy. And Maury would often say, I'm the happiest fella I ever met. And I truly believe that, that that's true. And I think, you know, the, the secret to the longevity of so many from this show is that was comedy, right? T taking time to laugh at ourselves and, and don't be so stressed by the day-to-day -day challenges of our world today, right? Uh, uh, appreciate what you have, laugh a little bit, right? Ma Maury wrote a little song, right? But the line is, start off each day with a joke and everything will be okie doke right? And, and it's a little corny in a way, but it, it's also sort of a life philosophy. If you could do that and not get so stressed, I, I think we're all, we all can uh, learn a little lot from that, right? And be a little bit better off. That's for sure. Am I correct that the only living member of the cast besides Dick Van Dyke is Larry Matthews, who played Richie? That is true. Uh, although Bill Persky, one of the writers from the show, is, is also still alive and well in, in New York City. So. so what made you decide to produce the documentary, David? You know, Harvey, as we said, 60 years have passed. The show is still out there and it's viable. New generations of fans continue to discover it. And I thought the 60th anniversary milestone of this show has to be acknowledged. So I thought, well, I wonder who's going to do it. And then I said, well, I know who's going to do it. And I said, I I'm going to do it. So I, I set out and began to send emails to all the folks with whom I've had contact through the years. So the, ca the cast members that were still alive, right? Guest stars who I'd interviewed previously, now the children. I thought it would be interesting to get the perspective of that second generation. You know, Dick Van Dyke's son, Christian, participated. Carl Reiner's son, Lucas, right? Jerry Paris's three children. Ann Gilbert's daughter, Nora. You know, of course, it was great to hear Larry Matthews' perspective of growing up as, as a child on the set and, and his remembrances. And it, it all collectively came together, I, I think, beautifully, so, sort of organically. How long did it take to make the documentary? Uh, I started in September, October of 2020, beginning to make inquiries. So many of the people I had to find, then as, as you're well aware with your show, right, you have to 
deal with the technology issues of, of Zoom and, and connections. And I began to just whittle away at making a list of all the people who I knew were still around that might be interested and started to reach out and contact them and then began to conduct the interviews and collect materials. Fortunately, my archives of you know well over 20 years of being a fan of the show in terms of photographs and memorabilia and props and all those sorts of things. But I'll tell you, many, many who participated shared with me their archives, right? So photographs that, that they had that I'd never seen before, props that I'd never seen. You, you know, the, the opening segment of the, of the documentary takes place in the writer's room and there's some Easter eggs in there for, for really eagle eyes of, of fans of the show. So we had a, a clapboard that, that starts the action. That was a recreation of the actual clapboard that was from the show. And I built my own, a recreation of that, because Tony Paris, Jerry's son, was nice enough to send me photographs and take measurements and all sorts of things so that we could construct it for that, for that little scene. Uh, where, where did the funding come from to make the documentary? It was all personal, personally funded by me. And, and again, my, ob my objective was sort of twofold, was to expose some new generations of fans to the show and provide an opportunity for long tenured fans to sort of revisit it with some fondness, right? And the other thing, that I did ask is if folks enjoy the documentary to consider making a donation to St. Jude, right? Danny Thomas's children's hospital, since Danny was such an integral part in the formation of the production company that brought the show to the air. And I thought that would be a nice tip of the hat and gesture to the cast and crew to let fans show their appreciation for these years of enjoyment. Wow, that documentary was really a labor of love for you, wasn't it? It was. Now, I want our viewers to know that you can see this wonderful documentary on the David Van Dusen channel on YouTube. Or you can go to Facebook and join the Dick Van Dyke Show 60th anniversary celebration page. David, has the documentary aired on TV at all? It has not. The, there, there are still discussions about potentially happening, but uh, I decided to use YouTube as the streaming platform to give it its broadest exposure. And fans, fans are certainly enjoying it. And I'm getting feedback almost on a daily basis. And it's been, as you say, Harvey, a labor of love. It's, it's nice to hear from other fans and hear their comments and let them express their appreciation, not only for the documentary, but for, but for the show and, and what, uh, what it means to everybody in, in terms of the various episodes. Well, what I really loved about the documentary is how comprehensive it is in terms of the history of the show. And as you've mentioned, you had so many children of the original cast members that you were able to get to appear in the documentary. Was it difficult to get the children of the originals to appear in the documentary? As I, as I noted earlier, I have become friends with many of them. Some of them took a little cajoling because they weren't necessarily used to being on camera or didn't want to be on camera, right? But many of them, because of the rapport we had established through the years, were, were very happy to, to participate. So two, two folks that I did not know previously were Dick's son, Chris, uh, and Carl's son, Lucas. But I reached out and explained what I was doing and received, you know, very favorable feedback and, and positive feedback in terms of they, they would like to contribute. And they, their insights, I think, are particularly interesting for, for fans to, to hear them. You know, the challenging part in some instances was finding them, right, locating them. Because, you know, a girl, for example, was now a grown lady and a married name and where is she and how do you find her? And so, so, so that leads to Cornell Shule, who was a, a young girl who was about Richie's age, Larry Matthews age. And whenever there were scenes with kids, John Shule was the assistant director. They'd say, Oh, we need some kids. And John would go home and say, 
to his daughter, well, I think you might be able to be in the show next week. And it turns out I was able to find Cornell and we did a Zoom interview and she was just delightful and thrilled to be included. And she had some very unique photographs never seen before that she has saved for all of these years and was very willing to share them with me so I could share them with others. Turns out she lives not too far from me. So last summer when COVID let up a little bit, I actually drove down to New Jersey where, I, where she lives and was able to meet her in person for the first time. So it's, uh, again, the, the relationships, the, the bonds that exist in this Dick Van Dyke Show family are, are quite unique, I think. Were there any surprising things about the Dick Van Dyke Show that you learned from making the documentary? I thought Chris Van Dyke offered some very interesting insights uh, uh, about his dad and about their life as a family. Because, you know, prior to the Dick Van Dyke Show, Dick was, you know, really working hard to, to try to get a career on Broadway and had some hits and had some misses, right? And then with the discovery of, of Dick by Sheldon Leonard and Carl Reiner and the success of the show, Chris shares that their life really changed almost overnight, right? Where they could go out as a family and, and do things and not really be recognized. Suddenly here was this major celebrity and everybody knew who he was, right? And it sort of changed life forever. So I thought hearing those insights was, was, intriguing right but chris also shares that that power of celebrity for the downsides of many of those things also offers the benefits of of many other things and opportunities that you would never have without that that celebrity you know he remarked about the opportunity to go to the white house and meet president obama and mrs obama right was was one of the the many things which he said we would never probably have ever had that opportunity, right? So, so th those insights were, were quite interesting. I also think, you know, he shared how much Dick worked off hours to stay in physical shape and to rehearse physical routines, right? So, you know, we all see the amazing things that he can do with his body that appears to be 100% rubber, right? But, you know, Chris said that, he, he worked at those things and he worked hard to stay in shape so that he could do those things. So that, that some little insider peeks behind the curtain, I think, about the, the way things actually happened or worked at that time. One thing that really impressed me when I was watching your documentary is just how much everyone who worked on the show really loved each other. They were a real family, weren't they? I think they were, you know, and, and their professional lives extended into their personal and private lives. And they often did things together and had parties together, you know, and Cornell Shule, who I just mentioned, said every year at Christmas, her, her family would host uh, a holiday party, right? And everybody would come. And he, they said the neighbors, you know, there's no paparazzi, but the neighbors were gawking out to see who's arriving next, right? But one of the things that she said the cast appreciated so much was the down to earth nature of the get together because her mom cooked all the food, you know, it wasn't catered like everybody would be used to being on the set and things. Right. So it was just sort of this informal, friendly, familiar sort of atmosphere. And everybody really seemed to uh, appreciate that. The documentary includes a special musical tribute to Dick Van Dyke by Broadway star Gavin Lee. How did you make that happen? Well, that's a great story, Harvey. So let's tell it, right? I thought I needed to have a special tribute to, to Dick. And I thought to myself, what, who can I get or what can I do? And I thought it would be a great tribute to see if we couldn't recreate one of the musical numbers that had been done on the Dick Van Dyke show. So I thought, what song could it be that would be appropriate? And Dick and Mary did a number of duets together, but I thought, what, what did Dick do alone? And it dawned on me, there was a birthday party episode for Richie where Dick appeared as a clown. And the song was written by show writer Sam Denoff at the time. So 
I did some digging and was able to acquire the original orchestration that Earl Hagen did back on the show in the early 1960s. And I was able to get copies of that and I wanted to recreate that orchestration. So again, keep in mind, we're in the middle of COVID. So I recreated a bass musical track and then I hired musicians on the internet around the world. So the clarinetist was from London and my trumpet player was from South America. And I sent them the parts and the bass track and they recorded them remotely and then sent them back to me. And we, we put together the, the musical track of the instruments just as they were played in the early 1960s. And then I thought, well, who, who could I get to sing this? And I knew that Gavin Lee, who had played Bert in the Mary Poppins stage show, had met Dick and knew Dick. Dick had attended the performance of Gavin Lee's uh, Mary Poppins in LA. And in fact, in one night, they had a special appearance where Dick appeared as the old banker. They wrote a special part so Dick could be in the show uh, as an aside. And I thought, boy, wouldn't it be great if I could get Gavin Lee, who played Bert to recreate this song. So I set out on the search and found Gavin Lee and composed the letter and explained what I was doing in terms of the documentary and who I was. And I knew that he knew Dick and would he possibly consider singing this song for, for the production. And I didn't hear anything for a while, but one day coupling into my inbox, an email dropped, from Gavin Lee, and he said, could you send me the song that you want me to sing? So I did. And a few days later, he wrote back and he said, I would love to pay tribute to Dick and be part of your production. Uh, he said, I only have one question. And he said, is that, and that was, would you like me to dance too? And I thought, well, Gavin, certainly, right? If you're going to sing, why not dance? So the musical track got sent to Gavin Lee. He recorded it and produced it in his home. Again, he, he was impacted just like we all were by COVID, but set up space in his home and produced a wonderful tribute to, to Dick, recreating Dick's performance and giving it a little bit of his own flair as well. So that, that, that to me is a, a highlight of the documentary for folks to make sure they see. Oh, it absolutely is. In 1997, TV Guide ranked the episode entitled Coast to Coast Big Mouth at number eight on its list of the 100 greatest episodes of all time. And the episode entitled It May Look Like a Walnut was ranked at number 15. Do you have a favorite episode, David? It is, it is that walnut episode, Harvey, right? The, the episode upon which I based my publication. It was a little out there in terms of you know, the dream sequence and, and all, but I thought fans really do appreciate that. And that that's why I thought when I named the Walnut Times, fans would immediately relate, oh, it's that Walnut episode where, where Mary comes out of the closet, right? I, I was fortunate to also get an exclusive availability to me in the documentary. It's colorized footage of that Walnut episode. Over the years, various Dick Van Dyke Show episodes have been colorized and rebroadcast again to introduce it to new generations of fans. That episode in color, the Walnut episode, was not fully colorized. They only did a, a small portion of that episode, but for the documentary, it was made available to me as an exclusive for, for fans to get a look at what it would look like had it been in color. Did any of the cast members ever tell you what their favorite episodes were? They have. You know, Dick, Dick always enjoyed physical things where he got to do physical maneuvers, right? So I think That's My Boy uh, was one that was in terms where they thought the babies were mixed up at the hospital, right? Where Did I Come From was a particularly physical one for Dick where he's running around and he has the wrong pants on because he's got sent to the cleaners and he drops the phone down the pants, that, that sort of thing. So, so Dick has, Dick has a few and he really enjoys them, not as much for the content of the, the episode, but what he was able to do and be creative in terms of them. I think Mary's favorites were ones early on that allowed her to 
be able to demonstrate her comedic ability. One where she gets a life raft that explodes in front of her face, right? When she opens her husband's mail, tries to, to cover that up. One where she thinks she's not attractive to Rob anymore, so she's going to dye her hair and gets caught halfway between blonde and, and brunette, right? But that's where Carl began to give her some scenes where she could, could demonstrate. Rose Marie's ep favorite episode was what she called her birthday episode. And Maury Amsterdam was when he was bar mitzvahed uh, on the Dick Van Dyke show, since he had never had that as, as a child. David, do you know why the show was canceled after five seasons when it was still so enormously popular? Yeah, so the show was, was not canceled. It actually ended as a decision made by Carl Reiner. Carl said at the outset that there would be five seasons. They stuck, stuck to that plan. Dick and Mary were getting offers for other feature films and Carl was going to go on and do feature films. So in the end, they decided that they would just keep it to the five years. Now, you mentioned that some of the episodes have been colorized. What do you think of colorization of black and white sitcoms? You know, I, I have mixed feelings on it, Harvey. I, I do think this show in true form is really appreciated in black and white. That was the era. But I also look at it and see that if colorizing it does bring it more to the forefront, in our society today and give some attractiveness and make it appealing to new viewers, th then I can also appreciate that perspective as well. I, I do like the, the black and white versions. I think that just because we're, we're used to it. Although it's fun from time to time to see a true color still from the show to see what colors look like, you know, in, in, real, in real life. In 1969, there was a reunion special called Dick Van Dyke and the Other Woman. It was a one-hour variety show that contained some never-before-seen footage from one of the episodes. What did you think of the special? I, I enjoyed the special a lot. It was nice to, to revisit the, the Petri living room, if you will, near the end of that special, as, as you noted. Written by Sam Denoff and Bill Persky. The the show really ended up being the springboard for CBS to offer Mary her own show in terms of the Mary Tyler Moore show. It gave again, some visibility to, to Mary and, and that's what attracted CBS to go back to her, to offer her her own sitcom. But it was a nice, a nice revisit, I think, to see Dick and Mary again. Um, and, and the scene you talk about, yeah, were outtakes where in, in the actual episode, Mary, Dick, Dick tries out to be an actor and it doesn't go well. And he sort of explains to Mary in the outtakes, Dick sort of broke down and cried like Laura would have uh, in one of her segments. And it's, it's quite funny to see if fans haven't seen it, they should, should dig for that and try to find it. It's quite funny. In 2004, there was another reunion special called The Dick Van Dyke Show Revisited, hosted by Ray Romano. What did you think of that show? I enjoyed that as well. In fact, I was present on the set for the rehearsals and shooting of that. It was quite, quite an experience for a fan of the show. Carl actually invited me to come and, and sit in the audience and sort of be a fly on the wall. But to walk around the bleachers on that set and see the Petri living room in living color was, was just fabulous. And to be part of that atmosphere and that environment of the cast members being reunited. It was certainly, certainly like going down memory lane for that entire several days of, of production. Uh, fortunately for me, I had established my rapport and friendships. And I think that's when I sort of realized I was maybe part of the, the Dick Van Dyke Show family. Carl had invited me in and I wasn't, I didn't really view myself then as an outsider. I felt like I was part of the inside group at that point. What a great feeling. It, now, some people are saying that we are now in a new golden age of television because of all the cable networks and streaming platforms. Are there any current or recent TV shows, David, that you really like? You know, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I appreciate sitcoms today, right? I, I think part, part of what the genius of Carl Reiner was was writing to 
sort of real life situations. And I find sometimes the situations today are not that, right? They're sort of made up or not something that's quite as believable. So I, I will watch occasionally, but there's nothing that's really grabbed my attention that I have to see every week. I, I'm, I'm interested now more days in sort of the dramas, I, the, the Downton Abbey's, the, the other PBS shows that, that I see. But, you know, every now and again, I, I'm up for, you know, trying a new show out to, to see if it might grab you or whatever. But I think I got spoiled by Reiner's writing, Harvey. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. So, David, if you had to sum it up in 25 words or less, what do you think accounts for the enduring popularity of the Dick Van Dyke show 60 years later? I I think it's the genius of Carl Reiner creating an atmosphere of fine actors and actresses and providing them with material and letting them run with it and having situations that we can all relate to. I think that's that's the secret ingredient. It's the secret sauce. And because of that, it remains relevant in the hearts and minds of so many today. Do you have any other plans in the works to keep the legacy of the show alive? The documentary was sort of the first start of that, and I'm, I'm trying to promote it so that folks can see it. I do have this uh, Facebook page to celebrate the 60th, and, and we'll drop some nuggets of memorabilia there and, and fans really seem to enjoy seeing some behind the scenes things. I'm currently going through and getting all of my archives digitized so that I have those folks should be aware of the fact that the national comedy center in Jamestown, New York is now the uh, owner and keeper of all of Carl Reiner's archives. Uh, And I'd be remiss if I didn't, didn't share that. And on July 1st of 2022, they will open a brand new Carl Reiner exhibit called Carl Reiner, Keep Laughing. And Carl's scripts from the Dick Van Dyke show and his two pays and his big bad Brady cowboy hat and all, all the things from Carl's career are now there at the Comedy Archives. And they're going to have a tremendous exhibit if folks are ever in in. The, the Northeast, put put that on the map as a as a place that you want to stop and visit. Not only for Carl's archives, but for so many other comedians. It's it's quite a place. Not only that, Jamestown is the home of the Lucy Desi Museum. Indeed, it is right. And really, the the, the Comedy Center was the brainchild of of Lucy. Right when Lucy was going to pass, she said, "I would like something created to keep comedy going." They, they started by doing the Lucy Desi Museum, which is also a fabulous spot with recreated sets and lots of memorabilia from I Love Lucy. And it took them a few years to get the Comedy Center built, but now it's up and running over the past few years. And they continue to increase their archives. And it's, it's really a spot on, on the map for sure. Well, David, I've so enjoyed this opportunity to celebrate the fabulous Dick Van Dyke show with you and to make our viewers aware of your wonderful documentary. I hope everyone will go to the David Van Dusen channel on YouTube and watch this terrific feature length documentary about the legendary Dick Van Dyke show. Thank you so much, David, for taking the time to come on our show. Harvey, it's been a pleasure and I'm so glad we could connect and and share our passion for, for this tremendous show. So thank you very much for having me today. Our guest has been David Van Dusen, producer of the documentary entitled The Dick Van Dyke Show, celebrating the 60th anniversary. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.